So hi everyone, we're gonna speak about random numbers. So first, a small quote about Black News. Random numbers should not be generated with a method shown at random, and we've seen too much uh, application just using the block hash or using multiple block hash where it's not secure. Um, when you are on classical computing, you have your own computer, you can use your time, data in your computer, most movement to get a random number. I remember when I was creating uh, my first Bitcoin address, uh, they asked me to move them out, to type random stuff on the keyboard, and you generate entropy. But the problem is if you want a random number in Ethereum, which is basically the world computer, you will each end up into a different one locally. Uh, why do we need those? So the basic use case is gambling. Um, we need those in proof of work. We need those in complex voting systems. Uh, probabilistic conversion method is, in my opinion, the um, state of the art in terms of voting system. We need those for drawing jewels. Uh, in the project I'm working on, uh, that's what we, what we use. Uh, we need those for AI to initialize machine learning algorithm. So imagine you have an AI on the blockchain with some economic personality. Uh, if you're able to fix the initialization number, you could trick the AI into learning badly, taking bad decisions. Um, the first method which we use is a, threat, a trusted party. So you have some list uh, random beacon uh, where you could plug an oracle on it. You can directly call oracles, but the problem is it's not decentralized. You have a single point of failure, and in case a trusted party is cheating, you have no way to detect it. Uh, we've seen a lot of first uh, on using block hash, um, but that does not work. So first, let's go back to basic proof of work. You have cryptographic function. If you want to compute h of x, it's easy. Uh, but if you want to compute x, so that x of x is y, it's computationally infeasible. So in proof of work, basically, you take the block header. Uh, you, you start with a nonce, like zero, uh, and you hash it and if it's lower than the target, you find a block. And if not, you increment the nonce with n equal one, two, three, up to the point you find a block or someone else did. So we could say, okay, at the end we have a hash which is random. Uh, no, because when you get to find a block, you can choose not to publish it. And even worse, with smart contracts, you can bribe the miner trustlessly into not publishing those blocks. And you don't even lose the world block reward because you publish it as a non -cut. Uh, so okay, only the miner can do this attack, and the effect is just, well, just re-rolling the number. So it does not allow you to fix it to a particular value, but it allows you to, to pay a small cost uh, when uh, you want to transfer one and get a new one. I've seen applications where saying, okay, uh, the attack cost is higher than what I have at stake in each block in my application, so I can rely on the, run, on the, the block hash to get a random number. Uh, but no, because uh, the block hash is the same for everyone. So perhaps even my application, it's not worth attacking. My neighbor application, not worth attacking. And your application, not worth attacking. But perhaps you can do an attack on all those three applications at the same time. And in this case, you may win more than the attack. Um, one method which is really useful when you don't have a lot of parties uh, is commit machines. So the ID, you generate a number locally, uh, you publish its hash, you let tons of parties doing that, they pay a deposit, and in the second phase, they reveal the numbers. Of course, we verify that the hash corresponds, and the result is the XR of all random numbers. And one interesting property of XR, if you XR something random with whatever, it's always random. So you just need to have at one party inputting a random number. Uh, the problem is that parties can choose not to reveal. And if a party does not reveal, the generation is stopped. So yeah, you could uh, describe the deposit of the party not revealing. Uh, and in, if, for example, I want to flip a coin with you. That's a really good method. Because it's only two of us. Uh, we fix the coin, and if I want to censor the flip, uh, I get timed up by not revealing, and I lose the deposit, and we assume that you won the flip. So that works very well. But now, imagine you have 1,000 users which are relying on the same number. And you just have one not revealing to prevent the generation. So you will need each party to have a deposit 
equal to what at stake for all the others. So this scale quadratically to the number of parties. Um, so it may be perhaps okay with playing poker, um, but for a lot of person, it won't work. Um, then you have threshold signatures. So a threshold signatures is a signature, which is uh, where a lot of parties get part of the key and they sign partial signature. And if you get at least the threshold of partial signature, you combine them and you get the signature. One interesting property of the signature scheme is that no matter which party are signing, as long as we get the threshold, we get the same signature. So if it's A or B signing or B or C or uh, no matter what, you, we always get the, the same signature. Um, so that's really good if you are in the honest majority model. Uh, because in this case, um, half of the party revolve and everything goes right. But the problem is if you, have, you can get attack of 50% uh, with party refusing to reveal, to, to sign, or even worse, with parties who will collude to get to know the random number and they can censor it uh, by making some blockage attack. Um, the other method is sequential proof of stake. So in classical proof of stake, you, oh, so, sorry, sequential proof of work, uh, in the classical proof of work, you can parallelize it. So you get one computer uh, having a nonce equal zero, one other equal one, um, and the more computer you have, the faster you get to find a block. In this one, it's not the case. So you start with the block hash, and you hash it, and you hash it, and you hash it, and hash it, and hash it, and hash it. Um, so at each step, you need the result of the previous step. So even if you get tons of hardware, you won't be faster. Uh, so what does it do? Uh, it's a time lock cryptography. Uh, the goal is to ensure that it takes some time to compute the random number. Such as this way, if you are a miner and you want to get bribed or you want not to reveal for yourself, uh, at the point where you have your block, if you wait to know this result, someone else will have already published one. So, okay, you can censor some, but you don't know what you censor. So it's still random. Um, but there is still uh, some catch, because if you want to compute some sequential hash, something like one million times, and you do that in a smart contract, you will run into the gas limit. So to solve that, uh, you need to use interactive verification. Um, um, I guess some of you have been uh, at um, TrueBit presentation. So that's the same concept, except here it's quite simpler because we're just hashing a little Merkle tree or complicated stuff, just hashes. Um, so you let every party post a result, a deposit, and then you have Replication game, which guarantees that each party uh, with honest, so the challenger of a fake number or the defender uh, of a, a right one, will always win the challenge. And when someone puts fake numbers, you burn part of the deposit and give part to challengers. Uh, so on charity verification, um, let's assume here for the sake of the example that the hash is just plus one. Don't do, use that as a hash, that's just for example. Um, you compute, you get 17, and some other party uh, said 35, which is the fake answer. So you ask this party what the value at the ninth step, uh, and he says 27. So now you know that he made a mistake between zero and nine. So you ask accept four, he says four, four is correct. So you know the mistake is between four and nine. You ask at six, he says 24, it's incorrect. You ask at five, and now you show five plus one is six, not 24. So you've proven that he has made some mistake in his computation. Um, but there are still some, uh, some issues with that. 
which is that uh, a party can put fake numbers, put some deposits, and okay, this party won't be able uh, to, to change a number, but this party will be to, uh, able to delay the time this number uh, will be available. Um, so also, if we implement the incentive in the challenge naively, you will challenge a number, and the party put in a fake number will challenge his own number and make sure to lose against itself in such a way that you don't win the, the part of the deposit. And our goal is uh, to design a system such that if you have even a small deposit that you can use to challenge it, to ch make challenge, compared to an attacker with a large budget making tons of fake numbers. And the goal is to say, okay, at the first one you are able to challenge one number, uh, you win and you get half of a deposit, now you have 1.5 deposit, in the second step you do it again, now you get two deposits, and now you get two deposits, so you can challenge two numbers at the same time. And next step, you get three deposits, and so over and over, uh, and your deposit is increasing exponentially, of course, up to the point where you finish to disprove all the numbers. Uh, so the other idea is uh, to split the reward between each party challenging, no matter which challenge uh, is winning. Uh, but there is still a, a catch, there is still an issue, where the attacker can, when you challenge one of these numbers, keep a huge part of his budget to also challenge it, so that this way you will get almost all the reward you will get peanuts, and you will never be able to challenge multiple numbers uh, in, a, in one uh, run of challenge. So how to avoid that? It's uh, with commit and reveal. So you commit to challenge a particular number. And in the second phase, you reveal that you, are, you wanted to challenge this one. And in such a way, the attacker, he does not know which of his number uh, you're gonna challenge. So, of course, he can try to challenge number randomly, but if he's gonna challenge a number which you haven't challenged, he will either lose the deposit as a challenger or remove the fake number. So in both cases, uh, he's losing. Uh, of course, in the worst case, in the worst case, you have a super lucky attacker, and each time he ge he's guessing right uh, in uh, the number that you're gonna challenge. Um, but of course, that's just like in the worst case. Uh, so we can uh, look at what would happen in the average case. And in this way, from all the strategy I search, an attacker could have. Um, I haven't found anyone which would not uh, allow to have the number uh, by a logarithmic amount of steps. So that's still a conjecture. You still need to prove it because you need to prove that there is no strategy allowing to do that. And if some, someone is interested by having this proof or if someone has uh, insight in this proof, I would be really happy to speak about that. Uh, so for this second half proof of work, uh, we've seen the problem, which is that it takes time. So it's not suited for a real-time application. Uh, if you want to bet, that's not a good idea. Well, oh, in the lottery, okay, but if you want to bet in real time, uh, that's not a good idea. If you can wait something like one day, or I guess in the future even less, uh, that uh, should be a really uh, interesting uh, method to get random numbers. Uh, there is still another kind of attack, which would be uh, on hardware. If you manage to get the hardware able to compute ashes order of magnitude faster than the hardware of others, uh, you could uh, compute it uh, super fast and know what the number will be, 
and this way do a block hash attack. So thanks uh, everyone. And uh, if you have uh, other question or uh, insight, uh, feel free to speak with me either there or uh, by email.